Welcome to this continuation of the readings of the Jesus Words Only Conclusion, and you're in the middle. So if for some reason you want to go back an episode, you'll see it in the description that accompanies this episode, and you can go back and uh, catch up on the prior episodes. And once you've completed this episode, you should be able to see the in the descriptions the next URL forward and be able to keep track. And this is also kept track under uh, what's called our playlist for Jesus words only readings. Okay. Uh, enjoy. Okay. So we're going to pick up on Galatians. Paul's regard for the law reached a total low point in Galatians with utterances, which no doubt would shock our Lord. Paul says the law given the mediator Moses was quote ordained by angels. So in other words, the law was not given by God. This is Galatians three verse 19. That's an important verse to remember the numbers. Because if people ask you, you know, how can you prove that Paul abrogated the law? You just say, look, he said it wasn't given by God. It was given by angels. Okay. Uh, and it gets clearer as you go. So you're going to want to memorize the next two citations as well. Anyone who wants to be in bondage to them desires to be in bondage to those who are, quote, no gods, Galatians 4, 8, and is seeking to be, quote, in bondage again to, quote, weak and beggarly elements, which is a term that means angels uh, in Greek thought. That's Galatians 4, 9. So 3, 19, 4, verse 8, and 4, 9 all tie together because it mentions angels in the first instance. It talks about them being no gods and uses a word, the language of elemental principles or elements. And in Greek thought, you would talk about the angels as elements because they were in control of the actual elements of the earth, you know, the wind, fire, water. Paul then goes so far as to say in the same letter that even, even if an angel from heaven should come with a gospel different than Paul, such an angel from heaven should be cursed. So he's going to curse an angel from heaven who would contradict himself. This is pretty, pretty braggadocious, if you ask me. Galatians 1 verse 8. By the way, Galatians is his first epistle, 47 AD. Okay. In Galatians, therefore, Paul put his words expressly above the same source he ascribed as the source of the law given Moses, angels from heaven. So see, he's taken the law down substantially by removing it from God's role. God didn't give the law. Angels did. He then insults them as weak and beggarly elements and Galatians chapter 4. We saw that in verse 8 and 9. And now in Galatians 1 8, when you read it together, he's talking about an angel again. Is if the if an angel were to even contradict him, it's not greater than him. He's greater than the angel. See what I'm saying? So in relative terms to the law, which no longer is given by God in his uh, uh, statements. That means he can contradict that law, and it's and, and that law has to fall to his words because he's superior to the angel. He can curse the angel, in fact, is what he's saying. So he is superior to the law, superior to whoever gave that law of Moses. And he says it's not God. It's an angel, which is false, totally biblically false. Now, that isn't to say the Pharisees had a tradition, an idea, that there was an angel who was in the burning bush but actually never speaks <laughs> But in their tradition, it does speak and does communicate. And so they teach that the angel gave the law. But in the Mosaic actual account by Moses, written by Moses, under inspiration from Yahweh, it's Yahweh only speaking. And the angel never speaks. It just It's seen inside the bush. And that's all that happens in, with an angel in the Sinai account. All right. In Galatians, therefore, Paul put his words expressly above the same source he ascribed as the source of the law given Moses, angels from heaven. Paul deliberately did so in order that we would accept his word as a superior authority to the law of Moses. I think you can see that now. He is superior to the actual authority he claims gave the law. It's false. What he's saying is false. It, it was not given by angels. It was given by Yahweh. A God, that God of Almighty, but He has recategorized. He's rewritten the law. He's He's rewritten the Bible to suit Himself and to make Himself superior to 
the law given Moses. Now, Jesus said, no, that's can't do that. <laughs> you have to teach the law. And the law was given by God. And he, Jesus is emphatic that the law was given uh, to Moses by God many times. Okay, this was crucial because Paul was informing us that the law of Moses was now abolished. So how else could Paul abolish the law? He, he has no position of authority greater than God, right? But he could be claim, theoretically, he's greater than an, an angel. I mean, he's, he, you know, angels are just an order of uh, life similar to mankind. So maybe, maybe we can't claim we're superior to angels. They may have more powers than us in certain ways, but we don't have any understanding that we're inferior to angels necessarily. So all I'm saying is Paul could get away with that. He couldn't get away. If, if the law was actually given by Yahweh, he couldn't make these claims. But he has denigrated God as the author of the law, and he can get away with these claims if you believe him. Which, should you believe him? No. It's all a lie. God, didn't, God, God gave the law, and the angels didn't give the law. So it's all tissues of lies. Such a bold declaration only had validity if the law ordained by angels was given by angels of heaven, over whom Paul was asserting a superior authority, even a right to curse them. Only by this bold contrast and curse upon such an angel of heaven, in Galatians 1.8, could we, we're moving to page 41, ever dare think a mere human could single-handedly abolish the law given Moses. Paul's hubris had therefore reached as high as he could take it to justify his doctrine. Paul did not limit this abolition to merely the commands in the law applicable to sojourners, that's Gentiles. So there's a category of commands against the sons of Israel, sojourners, uh, Levites, uh, priests, Levites, priests, and so on. So there are categories of laws ba based on different people groups. There's also laws applicable to the temple, upkeep and care, and things like that. So there's all kinds of laws. So he did not limit this abolition to merely saying any law applicable to Gentiles is abrogated. He didn't say that. He said it's all gone for Gentile or Jew. And he says there's no more Jew or Gentile. So he got rid of the legal distinction between a Jew and Gentile, which indirectly, by the way, gets rid of the circumcision command even for Jews because they only have to be circumcised because they are Jews. But if there's no more Jew or Gentile, there's no more circumcision needed. So there's just some, something you need to keep in the back of your mind when we get to that topic. If we do, Paul taught this truth of abrogation also applied to all the law's commands directed at Israel, Jews, the 12 tribes. Well, I, that's what I was just saying. According to Paul, by the death of Christ, the Jews now experienced the death of the husband God who bound them to the covenant at Sinai. Yes, this is a very important passage. It's Romans 7, 1 to 4. The legal effect of God's death under the law of Moses thereby released the wife, the Jews, to remarry a resurrected Jesus who no longer held out the law of Moses as any sort of guidepost in the new covenant. Yes, many people don't realize Paul is saying God died. God, Yahweh, is dead. Now, even the Gnostic Marcionites would say, well, God's not really dead. He's in Sheol. So Yahweh's in Sheol. So maybe Paul told his buddies and down the road, they realized, well, let's not say he's really dead, dead. Just put him in Sheol, put him in hell, and we'll be, you know, that'll be the end of him. <laughs> uh, but actually, Paul doesn't even give God any life. He says he's dead. And by the way, the Hebrew epistle writer says the same thing. He says um, the law was is um, goes into effect when the testator dies. The, the testator gave the law. Oh, excuse me. You know, the law exists. And the testator who gave the law provides basically when he dies that we would then get a new covenant. So as long as the testator is alive, we're subject to the law. But once the testator, the one who gave the law, dies, then we, are, we have the right to the new covenant. So he says as long as the testator is dead, we can enjoy a new covenant. And it's clear he means Yahweh's dead. Nobody pays attention. And it's the same thing that Paul is saying in Romans 7. So you've got Hebrews, you've got Romans, both indicating that Yahweh's dead. But they do it in such a way that it's so subtle, it goes over a lot of people's heads. Paul calls it a husband. And so you don't realize, well, who's the husband of Israel? Uh, it's In the Bible, it's always Yahweh, but he just used the word husband, so it's not clear. And then in uh, Hebrews, it's called the testator. The testator gives the law. And when the testator dies, um, the the a new covenant 
you know, the, the benefits, the, you inherit the benefits of the testator, and that would be a, a, a life without the law anymore. So the, the Paul and the epistle writer of Hebrews both get to the same result by the same means. The death of the husband, the death of the testator, ends the law. Paul says it ends the law between a husband and a wife. And it ends, in the testator case, it, it, it makes the benefits or the inheritance of the children of the testator go into effect only once the testator dies. So the testator must remain dead for the children to enjoy the benefits of the new covenant, the, the inheritance from their father. So it's just, it's sort of disguised, but not really. It's so, it, to me, it was transparent. And, and I'm just saying, when as a lawyer, you're trained to look for legal, what's the legal reason why something is legally in effect and something illegally gets abolished. So you pay attention to these terms. And, and even though they're used, uh, they're used abstractly and not and designed not to be clear to, technically to the average reader, they're still there enough that the the uh, someone like a, s- a scribe or a Pharisee or a Sadducee they would look at it and go, this guy is saying God the Father has to die for the people of Israel to be free from the husband and be free from the law, and he died. And, and that happened at the cross, and then Jesus replaced him, but didn't have the law anymore because he's not the father. And then, and then the Hebrews epistle writer has similar concepts with the uh, testator, as I said. Which, by the way, we shouldn't really call it the New Testament or the Old Testament. These are terms that come out of the book of Hebrews and is this whole concept of a testament, that if God dies, then uh, only when he's dead can we then uh, get the benefit of a new covenant. So it's really uh, extremely, and by the way, there's no, the Bible never talked about testaments where the Roman concept of testaments, where you have a testator creates a trust and when he dies, everything goes pursuant to the trust to the beneficiaries. This whole thing comes from a pagan, pagan, a non-biblical concept injected through the book of the epistle to the Hebrews, which is written by Barnabas. And that's where we get the Old Testament, New Testament. We need to get rid of these terms. If anything, you'd say the prior covenant and the new covenant. That's all I would say, probably, down the road. Down the road. We've got a lot a lot of things more important to worry about than titles. So I sometimes call it the Old Testament just to not, uh, but or Old Covenant, I'll say, or but I don't like saying New Testament because I know what it means, and I think it's offensive to God. But I sometimes may slip, so I'm not saying don't. Let's not get too hyper-technical about terms. Just have our heart in the right place on that one. But it's it's definitely some abhorrent principles in in our in our very Bible. Abhorrent, ugly, evil things that are just absurd. God dying, God cannot die. All right, moving on. Galatians four verse twenty two and following. Paul likewise said that the Jews of Jerusalem no longer correspond to sons of Israel but instead to the son Ishmael of Agar, and they continue in bondage to the law of Moses and are thereby thrown out in the desert. However, how could Paul be inspired by God in this when the same God said in Jeremiah 31, verse 31 and following, that he could never base a new covenant other than on the law given Moses or enter into it with any other people than the seed of Israel? Eisenman is perhaps too kind when he says Paul's remarks in Galatians 4 verses 22 to 31 contain a, quote, series of sometimes outrageous allusions. <laughs> okay, um, these are all hard questions with unpleasant answers. The answers call us to trust in Jesus's words above Paul's words. And I want to give you the footnote on Eisenman's remark. That's it. Uh, Professor Robert Eisenman, the New Testament Code, uh, London, 2006 at 587. Let's maybe take a break there. Yes. That'll conclude this episode. Please look for the next episode in the series. Thank you. See you next time.